You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, it's me, Tyler. Bose open earbuds are stylish. The color, it looks almost like an earring. I feel like it could go with anything. The music I'm making right now feels like a holiday. I want to look like it too. Check out Bose.com for more. Whole Foods Market has Thanksgiving gatherings covered. First things first, reserve your no antibiotics ever fresh whole turkey today, starting at $2.99 a pound. Or go with their organic spiral cut bone and ham, full of seared in flavor. For sides, choose Whole Foods Market grab and go platters. Go even further and get your whole meal catered. Just order online by November 26th. Get Thanksgiving ready at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. It's 1993, and the headlines are an embarrassing defeat on Clinton's second day in office. Clinton smarts from setback over nominee. And Clinton concedes he erred. The occasion of these negative headlines were that Clinton's nominee for attorney general, Zoe Baird, had withdrawn her name from consideration for attorney general. Zoe Baird was a prominent lawyer, corporate executive, career spanned in public service, also in private industry, graduated Yale Law School, clerked for a Supreme Court justice, worked in the Justice Department in Carter's administration, and had a senior role at Aetna Life and Casualty Company. She was general counsel there. When Bill Clinton took office, he had pledged that he would put women into government, and he nominated Baird to become the first female attorney general of the United States. Here's Time Magazine. The press treated the unknown Baird gently, with adjectives like brilliant, hardworking, and ambitious, sprinkled through the stories. Her resume was trotted out as the very model of the modern manager. It was noted that the woman not destined to restore order and morale to the 90,000-strong Justice Department had spearheaded a restructuring of Aetna's 120-member legal department. Time's not being very complimentary. In the wings, however, public interest advocates quietly voiced their reservations. Zoe who? A lot of people in the public interest community were saying, and indeed... Almost immediately, Clinton's nomination for attorney general will run into trouble because it comes to light that Zoe Baird and her husband had employed an undocumented immigrant as a nanny and a chauffeur for their family. Compounding the issue, they had failed to pay social security taxes for the workers, which is a violation of federal law. Although such arrangements were relatively common, especially among affluent families at the time, The revelation strikes a nerve with the public. Before it strikes a nerve with the public, though, in some back rooms it's striking nerves. And in particular, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who is Joe Biden of Delaware. Here's from Time Magazine. He first learned from Zoe Baird herself of her transgressions. Biden was shocked when a Clinton transition aide dismissed Baird's offense as a parking ticket. To his mind, a worried Biden told, Biden told his staff, It's a freeway, it's a crash. freeway crash. Putting aside the legal question, This is a big, this political, is a big problem. political problem. Biden told Baird, who was surprised by his reaction, that she had to inform the ranking minority leader, Orrin Hatch, and Senators Edward Kennedy and Alan Simpson. But here's the issue. Orrin Hatch, the Republican, so the ranking minority member of the Judiciary Committee that Biden heads up, the Senate uh, is controlled by Democrats at this time, says hey, you're not going to have a problem here. Tells the Clinton White House you're not going to have a problem here. Back in Little Rock, Clinton and his aides had perceived no danger. A transition aide recalls that the attitude about Bear's legal infraction was, everybody does it. When it comes out in the New York Times of what had happened, even Biden says, I, I do not believe this matter will prevent her confirmation. For Clinton, it also became an um, a story about confusion, about what Clinton knew and when he knew it. Just before it was announced, but after I discussed the appointment with her, I'd been told in a very cursory way about the hirings. He said he felt confident because Bart had consulted an attorney who was an expert in this area. Public outrage over Zoe Baird's hiring of undocumented workers and failure to pay Social Security taxes swiftly turned her nomination into a major controversy. Critics viewed her actions as emblematic of a double standard, a wealthy corporate lawyer earning 
$507,000 annually, had broken the law to secure child care. David Boren of Oklahoma, the Democrat at that time, uh, summarized, if there's any department store, you need a head where there's no question. It's justice. Now, the situation drew parallels to other nominations that had occurred now that failed, like John Tower during the George H.W. Bush administration, Theodore Soroson under Jimmy Carter. George Stephanopoulos admits, we read the signals wrong. In part, we didn't think it was going to be a problem because the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Orrin Hodge, said it wasn't. So what looked like a kind of understandable accounting mix-up with Zoe Bear's household didn't seem that big of a problem in the little vetting that we had done. But it got picked up on talk radio, and the message was crystallized. It was a very clear message. We're about to appoint an attorney general who broke the law, who hired illegal aliens and didn't pay taxes on them. And when it's crystallized into that soundbite, it was an impossible message to ignore or defeat. And I think what it tied into more deeply was that this crowd that is coming in is kind of an elite crowd who would have a sense of entitlement. So, um, obviously, uh, Matt Gates has been withdrawn as President Trump's um, attorney general nominee. There seemed to be some news that was going to come out either in the ethics report or some other reporting. Uh, either that or the whole thing is, um, you know, you put a stalking horse out there and then you get your nominee. It could be, you know, some form of um, brilliant politics there. What I do know from a historical perspective is the difference this story of a president, you know, two days into his administration having to pull a nominee with controversy all through the tra transition period was seen as an early embarrassment. There's no other way to say it. Um, the biggest one that you get is the Time Magazine front cover, you know, Clinton's first blunder with a whole expose on how this mistake happened. And you certainly do see a different treatment. Maybe it's the speed at which things happen, allowing you to just quickly snap in and put a new, you know, put Pam Bondi in. And uh, it's not a story. Maybe it's a double standard. I do feel that when you look at the history of the Bill Clinton's first couple of years, all this talk about, you know, liberal media, democratic media, things like that. There was probably a bit of that uh, in terms of some of the campaign picking up Clinton campaign messaging in the news and using certain techniques, making sure that the press had good, you know, visuals of Clinton and things like that. But when it came to that White House press corps that sit in that room, whew, that was a rough first term for uh, Clinton and particularly a rough couple of months. So I note that difference. Uh, we're not seeing this. It's like, this is a catastrophe. You don't see it spun in any way. Like, this shows disorganization. Nothing like that. Now, that, now A, that could happen with a few more. B, we're talking about, uh, this is going to come up a lot, a historic situation where it's a person that had the presidency before, so it's not a newbie. And do you get points for that? And... And then see, I think, the shock win every time you when you win in a political surprise and the so-called elites are uh, caught off guard, you know, they're going to have a harder and harder time making sort of uh, imperious criticisms of you. And, and you'll see Trump's winning was always a possibility. Most polls were leaning that it was at least 50-50. Uh, you know, I think that uh, out there, there was probably a sense that it wasn't going to happen. Here's an interesting story from uh, Robert Reich, Labor Secretary under Clinton, talking about the early Clinton administration, some of the meetings in an interview. Were there too many kids in that early Clinton White House? I used to get calls from the White House. My assistant over the Labor Department would say, the White House wants you to do this, or the White House wants you to go over there. The White House wants you to go to California. And I discovered there was not a White House that wanted me to do anything. There were usually kids about 30 or 32 years old that wanted me to do something. Okay, so I'm going to pause right there. Obviously, there's an OK Boomer situation going on here with Robert Reek, but even if you like the guy, you know, um, I know when I was that age, I certainly would have considered myself a kid. Uh, 
I do kind of understand sometimes, like kid, kid, but I think in the in the Washington sense and the Washington of 1993, where people, at least in the powerful positions, not the interns and such, you know, would have been older in the Bush administration. So he continues. They're usually kids about 30 or 32 years old that wanted me to do something. So I began asking my assistant, find out how old the person is who wants me to go. If the person is under 40, I'm not going to go. Over 40, then we're going to find out if the president really wants me to do it. So there's one day where he's told, like, you need to go to Cleveland. The White House wants you to go to Cleveland. Well, I have nothing against Cleveland, but I have a lot of other things that I want to do. And I said, well, who exactly in the White House wants me to go to Cleveland? It's not the White House. It's a person, I said. How old is this person? And my chief of staff came back and said, well, so-and-so wants you to go. And it turned out the person was 31 years old. I said, well, I'm not going to Cleveland. I mean, there's no reason that somebody at a relatively low level in the White House should be telling a cabinet officer to go to Cleveland. But I have a lot of other things to do. If the president wants me to go, if the chief of staff wants me to go, if some senior advisor wants me to go, fine. But no 31-year-old junior staffer is going to tell me I have to go to Cleveland. He later says, I probably did end up going to Cleveland. He talks about a meeting in which Clinton's face turns beet red and he starts yelling at everyone. This was after the stimulus package that he wanted to put through. Uh, The economy, you know, wasn't in great shape in early 1993. GDP growth was in the first quarter was something like 0.7, so less than 1%. Clinton won a stimulus package. It fails over a variety of squabbles. There's a lot to it. It's one of those 100-point plans. Um, He's starting to get upset because with everything they're doing, they have to keep checking with New York bond markets. If they don't, they're not going to get the Federal Reserve to allow them, um, in effect, by perhaps lowering interest rates to expand credit to people. Reich says, his face turned beet red and he starts hollering. Now, why are we doing everything Wall Street wants? What's the context here? He felt that the bond traders on Wall Street, the people on Wall Street who were most worried about interest rates, were running the administration, dictating to him what he as president could do. And I think deep inside Bill Clinton there is, or at least there was in 1993, a populist. Somebody who thought of himself as working for the common man and woman, the working people of the country. And here he had something that he thought was very important to get the economy going. And Wall Street had put pressure on to say no. The Federal Reserve Board had said no. Indirectly, through Greenspan, through Lloyd Benson, who's Treasury Secretary at that time, the word had come, if you do this, it'll make things worse. So you've got to sacrifice your beloved investment agenda. Alan Greenspan and the Fed had Bill Clinton in a vice grip. There's nothing else he could do. I just thought that was a little interesting side note about that that administration. I do plan to do a more detailed study. I lasted Clinton 90, 1993 in, uh, I believe it was 2009. It was a study of presidential first years, and I have that old episode. There's not much to it. It needs to be enhanced, and I've done some of that. It's one of these many manuscripts I have kind of running around here. But, you know, in the wake of this election, if you at least buy into what everybody's selling about it, that it was, you know, populism wins the day, I guess you got it to some extent. I've always felt that there was some change, some perhaps missed opportunity in 1993 where Bill Clinton had won as a almost populist candidate, unseating a establishment president, a Republican, in a time of economic distress. Not always clear economic distress, but, it, but you know, because there were many predictions that it had passed. Okay. One thing I brought up is... That sounds like a silly thing. At least it did at the time. His connection to McDonald's. I mean, all through the Democratic primary, you know, this funny Saturday Night Live bit where Phil Hartman uh, is as pretending to be Bill Clinton running around chasing customers and McDonald's and eating whatever leftover food that they have and the like and like that. That Bill Clinton loved McDonald's. 
And then after 93, you never saw him there again. And uh, I, I have brought that up on several times on this podcast. And I didn't think McDonald's would make a return into the body politic. But it, it's kind of funny that it had. But I always thought that was a missed opportunity. I think, of course, if you're somebody that's concerned with health, that's the logic that Clinton used in that uh, he was facing all these other policy choices where he was going to push a national health care program, where he's going to push for reducing obesity in children and reducing diabetes in children. People were talking his ear about that. And then uh, they had this um, program in 1993 where, because Bill Clinton loved nothing more than like one of these um, town halls. So it worked in the campaign. So as soon as he became president, they had several of these town hall events where people would ask him questions. They had one with children. And one of the first questions he got is, is why do you support McDonald's when they're uh, fatty foods and they're bad for you? It's bad for your health. And, uh, you know, I'm sure outside of saying like, hey, why weren't we prepared for this? Uh, because these town halls were a little spontaneous, you know. Uh, there was also the idea that uh, he he answered, you know, in some kind of general terms about, well, McDonald's trying to reduce the fat content or something. I, they offer salads, which they do. Uh, it's just people don't order them. Put that all aside. So I see the reason why it became impossible to both be a Democrat that was pushing a health care focus and also to embrace, like, the eating at McDonald's. But, you know, it's a trade-off. And, and it, it shouldn't have been seen as something maybe that was that easy as a trade-off. And now you see it entering the 2024 election. Two candidates associated with McDonald's. One likes to eat there. One used to work there. One did a stunt of uh, working there that, you know, at least as near as I can tell, um, dominated the news for at least four days of a very important campaign in which there was no debate, no second debate, I should say, for so you had a whole month of nothing but who's going to win the news cycle this week. And there's Robert Reich, who I, who I do believe did feel that the administration should be more uh, left populist, economic populist than it was and felt that he was, I believe his book was called Locked Inside the Cabinet. So he wasn't always happy. He was a good personal friend of Bill Clinton, but not always happy with his experience. You see that they get tripped up. Where they get tripped up in the early going is on the Baird issue and on the um, the haircut. Now, let's say that these stories aren't nuanced, but they take Clinton away from being that kind of populist uh, figure. You know, uh, during the campaign, this occurs. This, this is there's another thing that a lot of people aren't aware of, and I did a little episode about it. That within the Clinton campaign in '92, so you know, we're doing really well. We keep to this message. We have a very disciplined and organized campaign, but it's not really being tested. We don't have an ombudsman inside the campaign. So they had a, a group that had a secret Manhattan project, and they did some focus groups and found like. We hate this message that you guys are so disciplined saying. And there, as a result of the Manhattan group, you know, it it changed to where Clinton was starting to talk about his humble beginnings, him compared to Bush, him compared to a president, you know, um, that he was being attacked by people that had millions of dollars and things like that. And that was a more successful message in polling and focus groups than the kind of standard stuff. It's pretty rare that a president doesn't get their choices. There's just a few examples. Um, most recently, you know, you, you could take the John Tower and George H.W. Bush Sr. But when you start adding the people who were not denied by the Senate, but just withdrawn by the president, then you get a pretty big list of which Matt Gates now enters. You have near a Tandon. Uh, who was not well liked by progressive groups um, under the Biden administration? You have uh, Tom Daschle, who is going to lead health care under Obama. You had Judd Gregg, who is going to be Secretary of Commerce. That was kind of a sop to Republicans that Obama was giving there. And then there's just too much disagreement between Gregg, who was a Republican, and Obama over issues. And he just withdrew. Bill Richardson had to withdraw his name from consideration because he was under investigation for a pay-to-play 
scandal. Now that turned out to show no wrongdoing, but he still withdrew. Bernard Carrick under George W. Bush, he had hired an undocumented immigrant. So he had a kind of Zoe Baird scandal. Linda Chavez, same thing for Secretary of Labor, had to withdraw under. So you're seeing that like um, usually there actually are a lot of cases where presidents don't get the people they, they desire, but it's not often the Senate per se that does it to them that's pretty rare that you got tower um you got um dwight eisenhower appoints lewis strauss as secretary of commerce he had made enemies in the senate during his tenure as chair of the u.s atomic energy commission and loses the vote 46 to 49 pretty close that's covered in the movie oppenheimer uh, we talked about calvin coolidge who he appoints charles warren to be attorney general, and then really because Vice President Dawes doesn't get up in time, he doesn't break the tie, and the Senate denies his nomination. But it's really because there are, you know, Coolidge does not control all the Republicans at this time when he's president. There are progressive Republicans, and that's why they lose that nomination. Uh, Andrew Johnson lost an appointment also for attorney general. Tyler who was subject to Henry Clay's resistance in the Congress, suffers a bunch of them. Secretary of the Navy, his choice for Secretary of the Treasury, choice for Secretary of War, are all denied because they're quarreling. Andrew Jackson, uh, Roger B. Taney, who later becomes Supreme Justice, he tries to appoint him as Attorney General and uh, is denied. The reason is because of the battle between Whigs in the Senate and Andrew Jackson over the National Bank. And they knew that Taney had written the opinions for Jackson that strengthened his case going out to the people about the his opposition to the Bank of the United States. That's a very few over a long period of history. But when you add in the people that were proposed but not nominated, you're seeing several per administration now. So it's not all that uh, uncommon. I just note that in Clinton's time, it was really treated as, whoa, you know, what is this new guy doing? And look, Clinton, the image that we have of Clinton now, um, particularly for listeners who might be younger and to see Bill Clinton as an old ex-president that, you know, uh, might be more like considered part of an establishment. And no, no, when they came in, the Clintons were not well received necessarily by Washington, by the establishment, by Democrats in the House and Senate, the the White House press. Yeah, very difficult times. More to come on that. Blueprint on that is a uh, polling group, and they use web polls, which I'm not, you know, totally thrilled with, but they did a specific poll of swing voters 2024. Those who are undecided in the presidential race and who changed their voting preference since 2020. So if they voted Democrat in one election and Republican in another, or if they were independents who indicate they are so, who indicate they split their votes, or they're people who hold favorable views of both Trump and Harris or unfavorable views of both Trump and Harris. So these are the people that Blueprint interviewed specifically to find out like what makes them tick. They interviewed 3,262 over web panels on November 6th and November 7th. They say the margin of error is two. Swing voters, they say, broke for Trump 52% versus 38% for Harris. Half of these swing voters who chose Trump made a decision in the final weeks, including 27% in the final days. 15% in the last week, 12% on election day making the decision on Election Day, at least by their own accounting for it. This suggests that they were up for grabs. So when you look at those 38% of swing voters who voted for Harris, most of them came to the decision before. So most of them, uh, only 15% of those voters decided in the last week or election day, and they don't break that out. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first, like you know to check the date of the big game first before you accidentally buy tickets on your 20th wedding anniversary. 
and have to spend the next 20 years of your marriage making up for it. Yeah, checking first is smart. So check Allstate first for a quote that could save you hundreds. You're in good hands with Allstate. Savings vary. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois. The fight for racial justice in America is long. It's complex. Most of us only know bits and pieces of it. Many of those bits are often oversimplified, or we get them straight up wrong. They're sanitized, distorted, buried. This makes the struggle for racial justice so much harder. Just ask this school teacher in South Carolina. We probably seem crazy to some folks because we've been taught all our lives through the educational system and propaganda just to like pretty much survive and try to thrive in the society. But somehow spirits just in, you know, acquiescing to this system. I'm Ruxandra Guidi, and I'm the host of Happy Forgetting, a podcast about racial justice in America and those spirits that guide us in the struggle when memory fails us. It's an anthology of stories, six different styles, six different perspectives from around the country. There are no tidy endings, but there's possibility and learning, and sometimes there's even progress. Coming soon, follow Happy Forgetting wherever you get your podcasts. Hello all, Eric Rivenis with the Most Notorious Podcast here. Each week I interview an author or historian about a historical true crime, tragedy, or disaster. Subject matter ranges from gunslingers to Gilded Age murder to gangsters to fires to pirates to wild prison breaks. My guests bring their incredible knowledge directly to you. Please subscribe to Most Notorious on your favorite podcast app. Cheers and have a safe tomorrow but it's not a large percentage. Suggesting that, you know, when you look at something like that, at least partly this election was won in the last week. Why did they vote the way they did? Economy, inflation, inflation's the top issue, 73% disapproval on the economy among these people. They hold mixed opinions of Trump personally, but approved of his performance on the economy. If you look at this poll, The reasoning for the 2024 election is pretty clear. It's what we've said all along here. If you view things from a historical lens, incumbent party elections are about the incumbent party's performance. You can even bring in someone who used to be president, and it's about the incumbent party's performance. But what's going on in terms of uh, inflation, right? Because inflation is 2.4%. Uh well, what's the obvious answer there? The obvious thing is probably like, you know, if they didn't get the memo. Um, we talked about this previous. I, I examine whether I think the question is going to be, is it inflation as in the inflation rate now, the piece of paper you're handed now that says 2.4%, which is not much. It really is not. That's just normal price increases. Or are you adding up all the previous years and saying, well, it's like 250 for a gallon of milk and now it's four, that kind of thing. Obviously, they did some of that. And the economy was conflated with inflation because, you know, stats like perhaps a gross domestic product or unemployment even uh, may not be processed as as well as um, something that's so core like in, in inflation. I also question the economy a bit. Um, look, I mean, you're hearing some anecdotal evidence that Okay, unemployment's low, but it's in certain job fields. So when you look at the broader job fields, you know, is it really that low? Is there really that much growth? Have we really fully recovered from the pandemic economy? But, you know, you can't ignore everything. So there's social media factors, like what media people were viewing. Um, You know, it's just simply not normal for a sitting president not to run for re-election when they're able to, all right? George W. Bush did it, Obama did it, Trump did it, Clinton did it. So you're going all the way back to 1968 
Nobody remembers that. So this is a very unusual event and how voters perceive that. It wasn't the president running, which was weird. The whole um, series of events was weird uh, and led to shock and confusion. And then um, Harris and, you know, outside of a good convention week, you could probably criticize a lot of what was done, particularly in these last few weeks where even though there's a lot of campaign appearances, a lot of podium appearances, messaging wasn't clear, themes weren't clear. So let's look at, uh, so I talked a lot in the election about um, Alan Lickman because he was having a little quarrel with uh, Nate Silver. And so Lickman's prediction was that Kamala Harris would win the election. He uses a key system and there's various keys like mandate key. Did the uh, incumbent party win in the congressional elections? Uh, did they lose or did they, did they lose badly or did they lose, you know, normally is the incumbent president running? So you lost that key. Uh, is there foreign policy failures, foreign policy success, all of these things that they look at? He added up the keys and found that Kamala Harris would win the election. He did so in September. So what did he, what does he say now? He admits fully that he was wrong. He admits fully that the, the key model did not work in this instant. I don't think I called my keys wrong, Lichtman said. The contest key was rendered problematic by what went on with the Democratic Party. But I don't think you could say I called it wrong, except for in retrospect. At the time, it was the more reasonable call. He also cites an incredible explosion of disinformation on platforms like X, where untrue statements spread at large scale, including claims that the stock market was crashing and the unemployment rate was at an all-time high. Okay, so that really is his major argument because I watched his YouTube with his son and uh, Lickman really goes on for a long time on this kind of uh, disinformation thing. And essentially what that argument is, is when I de developed my keys, there was like TV stations and there were newspapers and there's certain, you know, factual basis for these things, even if you didn't like their spin on events. You know, you may not like the Washington Post or the New York Times, but there's a certain way they report things. With the new social media, people are getting their information not from these official sources, but from sources that have a definite agenda and that are exaggerating things and also creating disinformation. Like he says, there's people going there saying the stock market's crashing which it wasn't. That's one possibility. If you ask me, I think it's probably just a calling the keys wrong, but the key system still has a lot to offer in understanding elections. Uh, we really need to get away from Lichtman himself as the Messiah and more like he developed this model. We can all debate about what we think, with whether this key turned or not in using it to determine whether we think like an election will go one way or the other, rather than just have this prediction, Professor Nostradamus, because he developed a lot of celebrity after he had called the election for Trump when no one did early in 2016. What I think happened, I think the contest key, like he said, is rendered problematic. What does the contest key mean? One of his um, keys is that there's not a major challenge within the party. That key is designed to pick up, like if you're having a fight within your party and somebody's getting more than a third of delegates, say, you know, that's not a good sign for your party, like Carter in 1980 or Ford in 1976. These are the key examples, like, you know, Taft in 1912. You just can't, um, you know, win an election when you don't have your own party unified. But I think what you see tested in the 2024 is what happens if you paper over those differences? What happens if there is more maybe resentment or some level of uh, lack of support for the nominee because there wasn't a, a process? And so maybe that happened. Maybe some of it happened. So your contest key was artificially, you know, as he said, rendered problematic, like taken out of the model, which made it difficult. So he, he counts that as a positive, a no, when it might be a neutral. And then that would have eliminating it and going with one less key might have made it negative pro Trump alone. And then you could look at economy. And uh, so one of his things is short term and long term. And then, you know, maybe people didn't feel as great about the economy, even though on paper, all the stats relatively good. I don't think you can ignore all the kind of culture stuff either in this. And so I like, um, uh, Julie Rajinsky and her salty politics uh, substack 
And she's got an article that, you know, kind of connected with me because I'm Gen Xer. And it's like, how to talk to Generation X. Don't you forget about us. From November 11, 2024. Basically, the generation born between 65 and 1980 were instrumental now in delivering the White House to Trump. What's the matter with us? She writes. She's not a fan. I was born in 1973, so I'm here to represent. Here's my explainer. Gen X grew up on our own. We're the latchkey kids. We defend for ourselves during school breaks. We grew up without being coddled. My parents didn't show up to any of my games in high school or even knew when they were. It's not that they didn't care. They had their own stuff going on. We grew up in the Greedy's Good era. Formative years were influenced by Ronald Reagan, then by George Bush, by Alex P. Keaton, and Gordon Gecko. We did not grow up PC. Our Hollywood muse was John Hughes, who made movies that many of us can still quote, but would never be made today. The popular girl in the Breakfast Club was rich and spoiled. And she goes on and on. But her main point is, if there's one thing Generation X hates, it's a scold. We have been conditioned to tune out the nagging from birth. Democrats too often are coming across as scolds. Anyone who said the economy was not working for them, anyone who mistakenly used the wrong terminology, anyone who felt that they had to walk on eggshells in order not to get canceled. Okay, so she goes on, and I really do encourage you to, it's not that much, sign up for her Substack to get a different point of view on things. You actually can do it for free and then decide if you want to contribute and all that. You get the point. And I think uh, on the culture war stuff, see, I'm going to come down that the number one thing is the economy here. This was a basic economic election disguised at the fact that there's a man with orange hair running against the first female African-American candidate for president of the United States, nominated by a major party. Don't forget Shirley Chisholm. In some ways, 2024 was as boring as hell with a lot of flash and a lot of unpredictability but it essentially comes down to whoever has the white house they have to deliver they have to deliver performance um and it's a little better when you're running the incumbent president which you weren't and probably i'll admit couldn't couldn't wasn't possible i think there was still a way he could have done it but I'm not going to go as far as to say like that Biden, a healthy Biden, a healthy president, you know, might have been a better candidate. But it doesn't matter who the candidate is. I don't care. You know, take out Harris, put in Newsom, Shapiro, whoever you want to put in. They still got to answer for that economy that voters are telling you they feel. And that's the issue. And the culture war stuff and the um, scolding and stuff like that, yeah, that helps facilitate it. You know what that does, in my opinion? You could still win an election in that kind of turbulence, but it, it makes it a little tougher because people in social groups have to feel comfortable going out there and saying that I support, you know, Bill Clinton in this election. I support Kamala Harris. I support Barack Obama. You didn't have a problem in any office place, you know, saying like, I support uh, Barack Obama in 2008. I mean, outside of some. I, um, in 2004, I can tell you that uh, John Kerry, you didn't generally, but sometimes it was a, a little bit, a little bit, because that was right on the edge there, of being that issues of patriotism were being brought up in that election. Hey, generally, if you can't feel comfortable, like saying I'm voting for Democrats, and if, if they're called a bunch of scolds and all those are the guys that are telling me I can't use this word or that, that's where I think that plays in. It's unhelpful. I can't, I can't say it's a reason for an election. Still, I find this an interesting take, an interesting read. Watch Gen X. But just like anything with Gen X, we're a small generation, and we're going to be eclipsed soon, and the millennials will come back to the fore. Our moment of focus and the moment of complaints about us by baby boomers was pretty short, like, you know, late 90s into the 2000s. And then everything was about the millennials, right? So we always get a very short blip. We're a, we're a small generation. This blip of us being responsible for turning elections now, our magic power, will be short as well. Look, I want to encourage you to join Patreon, and I got more there. I just did a whole round of things that I picked up in the library to talk about, including the art of eating lunch. Yes, there's a whole chapter in a book about lunch, and I summarize it. 
talk about the 17th Amendment in another cast. Talk about a bunch of things there. So Joe F. writes on uh, Patreon, I think an inbuilt feature of presidential systems is its capacity to enable demagoguery. Not necessarily a criticism, he writes. It's just hard to see a Trump becoming a prime minister. And again, this isn't a comment on the relative merits of either system, but under the Australian system, it seems impossible this could happen. Didn't you have a little bit of an issue there with the Howard? Or you have a couple of couple of like big personalities in those systems. Um, look, I mean, the UK system um, resulted in an overwhelming victory for Boris Johnson. No, he's not the same as a, a Trump. There's a, there's a lot of differences there. I mean, you start with rabid enthusiasm for uh, Ukraine and other political issues where there might be differences. But, um, you know, you did elect a person that in the UK I see referred to with some of the same criticisms. And, and he started his career as a writer attacking the EU all the time and then became prime minister, you know. I don't think the parliamentary system protects you, but what you do have uh, in the American system is the ability for anyone to run who's a citizen, right, at a certain age. I mean, that's it. If the framers in their wisdom wanted to put additional things in there, they could have. I don't even see that mentioned at the Constitutional Convention when they're talking about the president. They could have put something like, well, before they become the magistrate of the country, we should have them be a senator. We should have them, and I know they wanted to pave the way for George Washington, so they weren't going to do that necessarily. Let's have them be a senator or one of the country's generals in the American Revolution. All right, let's limit it to those people. Let's put limits on who this person can be by at least like what title they achieve. So it's still a republic. It's still a democracy. And there's nothing like that. The closest you get to anything like that is there are a number of moves to have the Senate elect the president. And this is wildly opposed by people like James Wilson of Philadelphia, of Pennsylvania, who, along with others, would like a more popular election of the president. And the Electoral College is the system that they agree on. I think in a lot of ways, because of the mechanisms of it, different styles of voting in different places to make an equal system for a federal system of electing the president. But there's never an attempt to say the person has to have this office, but at least have served in Congress. No, it can be anybody. So it can be anybody. And Long ago, when I did an episode called The Moped and the Maserati about third-party candidates, I said, you know, as hard as presidential third-party candidates have it, and they do have it hard, there's one thing that enables a third-party president to potentially happen. Like, what, what makes a potential future Perot happen? And it is that there's a separate election for president. It doesn't occur, as you mentioned, on the, in a parliamentary system, all of the members are elected at once. And you don't have that. You know, it's still difficult because third parties don't have an organization in all of these states. But with the Internet, uh, this is me speaking in like, I forget when I did that, probably 2011. With the Internet and everything, you could have someone that's well-funded, gets their message out, and builds up little organizations in each state to elect this third party candidate. You had people who tried Perot got, you know, nineteen percent of the vote. George Wallace gets a decent amount of vote. Anderson gets six percent and a lot of attention. But it's it's hard with third parties because they don't have um this organization. But the one thing that they have going for them is the Constitution that prescribes a separate election. Doesn't require you to build a party first. Now what you have with Trump I think, is that a candidate that could have been considered like a third party type person decided that it's easier to take over one of the two parties. And it's logical. And to be fair, so I don't sound like a a partisan here, to be fair, I'm closer to this party. So it's easier for me just to get the nomination here rather than start a third party. 
he had tried to run for reform. I mean, it wasn't very successful. He had aced out um, Pat Buchanan for the reform nomination, you know, or tried to. Everyone looks to the framers. and the, That's why I don't use founders, because there's lots of founders. There's thousands of founders. If I say framers, at least we're talking about generally the people in the room in the Constitutional Convention and maybe a few more well-positioned people in the ratification conferences. And, you know, we think this is like they thought they were building this perfect system. And I, I don't know that they did. They were just building a system based on their political knowledge of the time. And they're aware of the same things that some of us fear. They're, they're aware of um, these things. And they put in some checks and balances. I don't think they ever considered that this was the perfect machine. That could never be broken, you know, but they put in those checks and balances. And so with a president, it's like anybody can. They didn't want to at first to limit the terms. They did limit the powers of the president. President has a lot more power by statute than it had when the nation started. Part of that's on us moderns, not on them. (laughs) Luther Martin of Maryland, who opposed the Constitution after he attended the convention, did not sign it. He brought up that impeachment's never going to work because those congressmen are going to be afraid to use that power against the president. And it has been attempted, largely has been proven right. It's a very wieldy power to use. Federal government also got bigger, which made the president bigger. That extension of presidential power, it's hard to put your finger on where it really originates because there's bubbles, but you know, certainly Jackson, Lincoln, these are people that even Cleveland, Grover Cleveland, you could steps, particularly with his vetoes, his use of the veto. But um, it's really Woodrow Wilson who has a big role in enlarging the size of the federal government, the powers of the presidency, what the president did. You know, that idea that I am going to go to Congress, I'm going to speak to them, that hadn't been done since Jefferson. So, and other things. I'm going to lobby for legislation heavily in in all of this. He had written about this as a Princeton professor. He wanted the presidency to be stronger and he got his wish. You know, it kind of originates there and you move up from there and you get to the Cold War. America becomes a more important country in a national security sense, leader of the free world. You're not going to say leader of the free world in Woodrow Wilson's time. He's just starting to get to the point where Americans even have a role in the process. And believe me, in the beginning, when Woodrow Wilson tries to assert that role in negotiating an end to World War I before we entered it, um, uh, it was a real convincing to get the British to even take us seriously. You know, that's where the, the presidency is. So it has a lot of powers. It has a lot of day-to-day focus. It does allow for... Um, you know, again, and I'm going to put, you know, caution that demagoguery is going to be depending on your political point of view. It could be like hearing great things uh, or it could be demagoguery. So Kip W. says about the election economy, I'm retired and have more spending money than ever in life with this boom market. But I've had daily anxiety attacks with every visit to the grocery store. Cannot imagine how the working class survives. Um yeah, so I, I guess I understand that because there's two things about inflation to make it important. One is that of all the economic stats, it's, it affects the largest group. Why? Because it affects people who are working or not working or retired or whatever you are, young, old, you're buying things. Unemployment is devastating for those that it hits, devastating. And when it's in large numbers, it's going to have effects on all kinds of people and families and households and everything else. So when it's not present, it's not present and you're focused on then prices going up. 10% more for the coffee you're buying versus not having income to buy coffee at all. That's what we're talking about, that difference. But in volume, so inflation is a volume problem. It affects more people. Here's the other thing. Historically, we haven't had it. This inflation that was ticking up. You know, I can point to you numbers. I'll always point out lumber. Lumber goes up during the Trump administration. It goes up a lot more in 2021. Don't get me wrong. It does. Still up in 2022. It then comes down, but it's higher than it was in 2017 right now. So that means by, you know, building houses, put a new deck on your house, anything you want to do, that lumber 
per thousand board feet is is has gone up since 2020. But generally, the inflation's gone up during the Biden administration. And so it's not like this happens every couple of years. If it did, it might have been less a factor in the election. It might have been less a factor to you. you. Might not like it, but it might be less of a factor, less of a shock. We haven't had it. You haven't had it in any form you can even talk about it since 83, 84. So that's a factor to consider when evaluating, like, what the heck happened in 2024? It's like, well, what the heck happened? Sometimes you got to look at oh, what events were present, like, you know, president not able to run for re-election because of health reasons, or communication reasons. Um, party, in a sense, rejected the president. Maybe he did it in a nice way, but still did. And then rejected the president being that nominee and then uh, at the same time which is historic and then at the same time inflation which many of the people living now never experienced thanks kip for your question thanks everybody for supporting please i encourage you to support the patreon uh, my history can beat up your politics.com thanks for listening all you need is a few minutes to start your day off with something historic when you listen to the This Day in History podcast. Every day there's a new episode for you to listen and learn about what happened that day way back when. So listen and subscribe to This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. That's This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts.